Ladies and gentlemen, um, very warm welcome to the American Numismatic Society and to this year's uh, Fowler Memorial Lecture. Uh, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce to you today uh, Amelia Dowler, who is the curator of Greek coins at the British Museum and who had the profound misfortune to follow in that post possibly the most delinquent curator of Greek coins that that institution has ever seen. <laughs> so I will apologize for that <laughs> up front. Uh, Amelia, since her arrival there um, six years ago now, six years ago now, um, has been beavering away at various things. She's been working particularly on the Money in Africa project, and the result of that has been a volume Money, Trade and Trade Routes in Pre-Islamic North Africa. Um, which she co-edited. She is also the, uh, the director there of their summer school in numismatics. Um, and most recently, she has been exploring the curious phenomenon of finds of Greek coins from Britain. And that is what she's going to be talking to us tonight, or tonight about this evening. Authenticated accounts, discoveries of Greek and Roman provincial coins in Britain. Thanks. Uh, good evening and thank you very much Andy uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak to you this evening. In particular I would like to thank Uta Wartenberg, Andy Meadows of course and Joanne Isaac for uh, arranging my visit. I think it works, excellent. I have been working on Greek and Roman provincial coin finds in Britain for the past year and this evening I will present some of the history of the subject the inherent problems in gathering the material, and possible interpretations for such material turning up in Britain. The authenticity of ancient losses of these coins in Britain has long been debated, and my survey is an attempt to gather as much information, information as possible to bring about a new discussion of the topic. This is an ongoing project, and I will eventually publish a catalogue of the material with analysis of the key questions. Uh, so. I will not be delivering any dramatic answers this evening, I'm afraid. Though if you have any answers, I'd be pleased to hear them. Reports of Greek and Roman provincial coins being found in Britain are nothing new. There is a long history of such finds from the early 1800s onwards. These particularly gathered pace with important finds in Devon and Dorset. Among significant finds from the 18 and 1900s are those in the Exeter and Dorchester areas and hordes of Alexandrian tetradrams in London and Guernsey. Today, such finds are often recorded on the Portable Antiquities Scheme database, where there are a growing number of single finds from across the country. Single finds compose a large number of these coins, and information about them has historically been recorded by museums across the country. Examples of this material range from autonomous Greek coins of the 5th to 4th centuries BC, right up to the end of Roman provincial coinage at the end of the 3rd century AD before Diocletian's reforms. They are also geographically disparate. We have examples from Central Asia to Spain, with particular concentrations of material from Asia Minor and Syria, Egypt, Sicily and Southern Italy, and Western North Africa. These are a few examples of what I shall be discussing. As you can see here, many of the coins I'll be referring to are very worn, and I'll, I'll return to this point. I'm afraid there aren't going to be any beautiful coins this evening. Uh, this is pretty much uh, all we have. Um, this uh, material has remained controversial since the earliest days of its reporting. Uh, if I can get this to work, we have here um, a Third, ooh, there we go. Third century um, coin of Syracuse, uh, third century BC, um, and also, ooh, yes, uh, from Numidia, and a Vespasian um, Alexandrian tetradram. Um, really, the crux of the matter is whether such coins were lost or buried in Britain at a date contemporaneous or nearly so to their minting. There have been various theories attached to this. While my subject is Greek and Roman provincial coins, there is a clear difference between these, certainly as far as dates go. Autonomous Greek coins were minted before the Roman invasion of Britain. 
While the Roman provincial coins were minted by civic mints and not imperial ones, they were at least minted during the time of the Roman Empire. So there is at least the possibility that they form part of currency circulating amongst the provinces more generally. Historic ideas for the arrival of Greek coins in ancient times have included theories about trading expeditions, especially for tin, by Carthaginians or other Mediterranean traders. This is no longer a theory which holds much popular support, partly at least because Greek coin finds are very varied in both type and date of coins, and there does not appear to be any specific pattern to their find spots, which, may, which might suggest a trading station which regularly received payments in such coins. There still, of course, remains the possibility that such coins were either used or lost in Britain by traders before the Roman conquest, though not in any official or systematic way. So turning to the debate in the 19th century and the, the beginnings of, of this subject, uh, from the very first numismatic journal of 1836 to 37, uh, this was published. Mr. Short is thanked for the offer he has been so good as to make us. Accounts, authenticated accounts, of discoveries of coins in England and elsewhere must be interesting to all antiquarians, but it is very difficult to authenticate the finding of some coins. The excavators never proceed to their work without a good supply of specimens, which are sold to the unsuspecting, who are told they are discovered on the spot. A little circumspection will protect the local antiquary from these impositions. The coins thus sold are genuine, it is true, but they are the very refuse of 10th rate collections. Mr Short was Lieutenant William Taylor Peter Short of Heavy Tree, Exeter. The editor of the Numismatic Journal, and subsequently the earliest Numismatic Chronicles, was John Young Ackerman, and this debate over authenticity continued between the two gentlemen over the first few years of the Numismatic Society of London mainly in the miscellanea and correspondence sections of the journal. Short had left the military and came to live near Exeter in 1832 and spent the next 20 years or so investigating the antiquities which were coming to light in the various excavations and building work of Exeter at this period. Short did not focus solely on numismatics, but published and commented on all the antiquities which had been found intervening on a number of occasions in the works. In 1835, indeed, a court case was occasioned when Short had the site foreman, Henry Hooper, summoned for assault. It appears that Hooper had ch chased Short off the site with a shovel full of soil. In evidence, Hooper stated that Short's continued habit of retrieving artefacts from the site had been hindering the works and that he had been chased off after repeated requests to leave. Though the mayor of Exeter supported Hooper and fined him only a token amount, the subsequent local and national press coverage was generally supportive of Short. His methods may not have been scientific, but Short helped to lay the groundwork for more care and attention to the archaeology of areas such as Exeter, where building works were taking place at this time. The case, widely reported, helped to bring British archaeology to public attention and popularity. Coins discovered during these works were described by Short in his response to the Numismatic Journal's invitation in 1836. Ironically, Short calls upon Hooper, amongst others, as witnesses to the genuine discovery of Greek coins on the site. Short states that, It is indisputable that among many curiosities dug up in our ancient city, a number of coins of the Roman colonial possessions have come to light, from the Greek cities in Syria and Asia Minor. I was at first sceptical on this point, but my doubts were entirely removed by the repeated appearance of such coins. How they came here is a matter of conjecture. He goes on to describe a number of coins, as you can see here. Short also pointed out that the workers have no means nor even opportunity of proceeding to their work with a good supply of specimens, as you have termed it. And he concluded by hopefully stating that, I therefore trust you will in your next journal notice us more kindly. This was not to be. An immediate response from the editor is printed in the same volume. Ackerman opens directly with, Our correspondent will accept our best thanks for his communication. 
He is, however, mistaken in supposing that we for one moment doubted the correctness of his former statement as to the discovery of coins in the ancient city of Exeter. With all due respect for the zeal, learning and ability of our correspondent, we are nevertheless compelled to say that he occasionally gives his imagination the rein, as is shown in the letter with which we have been favoured. He goes on to analyse Short's description of Greek coins here and correctly identifies them all as Alexandrian coins. Short's misreading of the inscriptions, and particularly the suggestion that Lambda Sigma stood for Ludi Cyclares, is dealt with very clearly, since for, for anyone familiar with Alexandrian coins, these are dates. The Lambda standing for the word year, and the following letter for the reigning date of the particular emperor. Here Short has also compounded his error by misreading the letter as sigma, when it should be epsilon, the Greek letter for the number five. And here are some examples of the kinds of coins described by Short. You can see what Short means by the coarse, massy appearance. Ackerman points out that the fabric of all Egyptian coins of this period is peculiar and ought in a moment to be recognised by the numismatist. This is no doubt true, but Short had arrived in Exeter only a few years before these discoveries, and certainly from his descriptions and interpretations of the coin inscriptions, appears not to have been familiar with a wide variety of coins. Ackerman concludes by saying that, we have been led into these remarks by a conviction that Mr Short, who deserves well of our English antiquaries, will profit by them and avoid rushing to hasty conclusions on a subject which, of all others, requires the most minute and deliberate investigation. Mr Short promises us a small work on the antiquities recently discovered at Exeter, which we shall be glad to see. But he must carefully revise what he has already written, and be less fanciful in the description of the interesting relics which have been lately brought to light in that city. This rather scathing dismissal of Short's assertions relies heavily on Short's own inabilities to identify the coins correctly, and also for his suggestion that William Stukeley would have been delighted by the discoveries at Exeter as evidence of the mighty though mutilated remains of the cohorts which fleshed their maiden steel in our southern hemispheres. Ackerman counters this swiftly with a blunt statement that Stukeley was a madman and has done more to bring antiquarian studies into contempt than any author that ever wrote. It seems clear that Short and Ackerman were unlikely to see eye to eye on this matter, and this becomes even more apparent in the first volume of the Numismatic Chronicle of 1838-9. Though not referring to Short by name, rather as our worthy correspondent at Exeter, it is quite clear to whom this passage is addressed. It's quite a long passage, but uh, in particular I draw your attention to the fact that Ackerman believes Short to have been the victim of a very gross fraud, and that any of these coins must have come from collections and sold to the unwary. Note towards the end of the passage the assertion that we have often seen coins with the types nearly obliterated, and which had perhaps been rubbing together in a little bag in the labourer's pocket for many weeks previously, sold to the, to the curious by these rogues, as then dug up on the spot. Ackerman's condemnation of single fines is not nowadays current opinion, and witnessed the growth of the portable antiquity scheme data, to which I, I shall return later. Though it appears Short was not deterred by this com condemnation of his findings, he went on to publish his Silver Antiqua Iscana in 1841, which contained a selection of the Greek coins at Exeter, here. Uh, the investigation of such material in Britain had been roundly condemned as foolish at best and fraudulent at worst. Whenever similar material was reported subsequently, it was often dismissed as a fraud, and this has been the widely held view until today, with some notable 20th century exceptions. And um, those of you with a, with a sharp memory, uh, this coin was the one which uh, Short described earlier in, in a rather fanciful um, fashion, but it appears for this publication he revised his identification in line with, um, with Ackerman's advice. The material found at Exeter in this area has been re-examined a number of times since short time and has divided opinion. 
In 1907, Haverfield and MacDonald dismissed the coins as very unlikely to have been found in Britain, since such finds were rare and not to be expected on British archaeological sites. The Smith and Street coin uh, finds of the 1930s, um, this is Exeter, and um, Smith and Street is just there. Uh, they reawakened interest in the case and the debate was revived. Haverfield and MacDonald had noticed a discrepancy in the numbers of coins reported by Short. When they examined the coins, there were about 150, which was rather more than the 120 of Short's publications. When Goodchild and Milne re-examined the case in 1937, it appears that they could not see the material at all, since it could not be found in the Royal Albert Memorial Museum. Um, and uh, if anyone's visiting Exeter, that's where the, the museum is, very close to the, uh, the fine spots. They theorised, however, th that the complicated path of the collection from its original owners, a Mr Jenkins and his son, via a collector called William Norton, and eventually to the museum, probably meant that other material had been added, and that the current Norton collection held at the museum did not represent exactly the material seen by Short in the 1830s. George Boone made a stinging dismissal of the Exeter material in 1991, dwelling particularly on the condition of the coins. And this is a very good point to make. Ackerman had already pointed to the worn nature of many of these coins as a piece of evidence for their being refuse of 10th rate collections. But Boone, after Collis's examination of coins in Winchester, suggests that though worn, the coins found in Exeter were not corroded enough to suggest that they had lain undisturbed for 2,000 years or so. Boone was ever more convinced from his examination of the material that they were more recent imports from the Eastern Mediterranean, and he listed in his article on the coin finds at Exeter many examples of British engagement in conflicts in the Middle East over the years to explain such finds. This table shows material from Exeter after the Broadgate, the, uh, the Broadgate excavations which were described by Short. This is a good example of the kinds of material which continue to turn up in Britain and why this subject remains current despite its dismissal by Boone and others. In Exeter the condition of the collection is now rather poor. I examined it a few months ago and during its rehousing in 1997 it was discovered that 56 of the original Norton coins were missing. If the remaining coins are counted and added to those, there is a total now of about 240, uh, although I have a listing of 241, um, which are all listed as from Broadgate in 1810. A large number of these are unidentified, which may explain the discrepancy with the numbers in, in the original publication. There is considerably more than the 150 or so suggested by Boone, Haverfield and MacDonald and this alone would warrant a re-examination of the material. The existence of other similar material in the collection of Dorset County Museum also asks for closer attention. J.G. Milne published the Racket collection of coins in 1948, following his work on the coins from Exeter. These are now held in Dorchester at Dorset County Museum and there are 103 Greek and Roman provincial racket collection coins, plus about 80 coins marked found with the racket collection. Here is racket as a young man. To the bottom right is a view of the church at Spettersbury, painted by racket himself. Um, over the years, the Reverend Racket has been treated in much the same way as Short. The suggestion that he had been deceived by local labourers who knew that he would pay for coins for his collection, just as it was alleged Short did, has been hard to shake. Both Racket and Short were enthusiastic amateurs. In Racket's case, his enthusiasm for local antiquities did not lead him to the local court of law like Short. However, his parishioners did write complaints to the bishop about Racket, and his neglect of the parish in favour of, of his pursuit of his hobbies. The allegation that increasing numbers of his parishioners were converting to Catholicism led Racket to answer questions in the House of Lords in 1829. The Times of London reported that, if the Catholic religion had increased there, let him not hear it said that it was owing to the encroaching spirit of that religion, but let it be attributed to the real cause, 
the want of efficient discharge of clerical duties on the spot by a resident clergyman. Rackett's unusual trihedron tombstone, which is to the top right here, <coughs> reads, his diligence and eminent talents were not confined to the exercise of ordinary parochial duties. They extended themselves to the promotion and cultivation of the various useful arts which soften the asperity of human nature, and of those sciences which till the mind with the most exalted ideas of the goodness of the creator. The Greek and Roman provincial coins in the much wider Racket collection were collected in a few years before Racket's death in 1841. From archive material, it is clear that he had been in the process of organising the material and making further investigations into their find spots. Unfortunately, this work was not completed. So today, only about a third of the coins have find spots marked, as you can see here on the map. Uh, so there's uh, Dorchester underlined in red, and the uh, solid dots are all um, find spots for, uh, for these coins in uh, the Dorset area. The coins in Dorset County Museum today pretty much represent the whole of Rackett's collection, unlike in Exeter. They are not, however, in good condition, and a number appear to be missing. If we look at the identified coins from these two collections together, this is the picture which emerges. I have divided the coins into geographical areas of origin. You can see that important concentrations of material come from Italy, Sicily, Syria, Phoenicia and Egypt, Cyrene. This is something which is reflected across the country when similar material is found. It is most likely to fall into one of these groups, or, which is not very well represented here, into the Punic Numidia group. I have not made a distinction here between autonomous Greek coins and Roman provincial coins, but there is a significant difference between Dorchester and Exeter. In Dorchester, the majority of coins are autonomous Greek coins, whereas in Exeter, a, sub a substantial majority are Roman provincial, particularly from the Syrian mint of Antioch and Egyptian Alexandria. The table to the left shows all the material in the racket collection. However, if I remove all but the coins with recorded fine spots, it looks like this. While the numbers decrease, there is not actually a dramatic change in the proportion of, of coins from those uh, key areas. So it is possible that the entire collection is, is representative of what has been found uh, locally, although I don't think we will ever be able to establish that um, for certain. The state of the collections at Exeter and Dorchester are currently quite poor and considerably more work needs to be done to sort them out. I have not yet been able entirely to reconcile the coins in these collections with the listings provided by the publications over the years. This has not been helped by the fact that such publications are not often illustrated throughout, if at all. Um, in the case of Milne's publication of the Racket Collection, there are no illustrations at all. Many museums across the country hold maybe one or two examples of these coins. Too often, however, the provenance is something like found while digging in a garden, um, or even vaguer descriptions. This makes it very difficult to decide whether a provenance is secure or not. To return to the Numismatic Chronicle, there has been a consequence of reports like this one in 1846. We are still as sceptical as ever about the finding of Greek coins in England. We do not deny that they have sometimes been dug up. What we contend for is that they were not ancient deposits. A single coin, or even a dozen, may be dropped anywhere, and may be discovered with Roman denarii or money of the Middle Ages, but nothing can be deduced from the finding of a Greek coin under such circumstances. Some years since, we were invited by a worthy baronet to inspect a large parcel of coins which it was said had been discovered on his estate in Kent. They were both Greek and Roman, and most of them in large brass, and genuine, but in bad condition, and they certainly looked as if they had, been recently, if they, as if they had recently been disinterred. But among them were several Paduan forgeries. Now, assuming that these coins had been dug up as stated, the probability is that they were the produce of some robbery. They had perhaps been buried by those who stole them, and justice having overtaken the thieves, they were for a time hidden, until accident again brought them to light. It's a similar case in Shropshire. 
And this is again from the Numismatic Chronicle. The coins reported here, and this at least gives a description of the coins, um, unlike in the 1846 report, um, have now apparently been lost, or at least Ludlow Museum, their repository, has no trace of them. It is possible, I've been told, that the county archives in Shropshire have rubbings of them, apparently, um, and I will be inquiring there about them in the new year. The consequences of widespread condemnation of Greek coins in particular has meant that they have often been poorly reported and preserved. This all adds to the difficulties of tracing many of them today, particularly from historic finds such as at Acton Scott. This is frustrating since, in line with Boone's comments about the condition of the coins, that they were not likely to have remained in the ground in Britain for very long, it would be good to examine the coins to see whether any pattern emerges. There are a few sources for these historic finds, recorded in particular by Milne at the Ashmolean and Robinson at the British Museum. This example is a particularly good one, which I've actually managed to track down in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Um, but by no means is it always so simple, um, since the museum where the coin ended up is not generally listed, but merely its find spot. So the way I've been working is to uh, find the nearest museum to the find spot and, and make inquiries. However, many museums have historically dismissed local finds and have only occasionally taken such coins into their collections. As you can see here in a letter to Robinson in 1948, it was generally accepted to treat such finds with great suspicion. As the writer here points out, there is good reason to be suspicious. Even where the object was not outright trickery, the possibility for confusion and mistake is huge especially where the history of a collection is confused or material has passed through many hands. However, I have personally seen about 500 such coins supposedly found in Britain in various collections, and I have now um, references to over 350 more, which I've yet to check, and, and this is increasing um, alarmingly. And this is a sizable amount of material by anyone's reckoning, and surely something which deserves more careful thought. I shall devote the rest of this lecture to possible explanations uh, for the arrival of these coins in Britain at whatever date and the future prospects for the further investigation of the subject. I have seen 234 Greek and 213 Roman provincial coins, mainly from Exeter and Dorset. The other museum collections so far are the British Museum, the Ashmolean Museum, the Fitzwilliam Museum, the National Museum in Cardiff, Plymouth Museum, and the Wiltshire Museum in Devizes. These tables do not include an additional 43 illegible coins from Exeter, as it is not currently clear whether they are Greek or Roman provincial, or indeed either of them. Um, there are some, some odd finds in Exeter, including a possible Ottoman coin, um, so it's possible that they're, they're not Greek or Roman provincial at all. Um, and I've included in the Syria-Phoenicia group um, the handful of coins which have come from a further east um, in Mesopotamia, for example. Since the coins from Exeter and Dorset make up a very large number of these, this is the picture without them. As you can see, the numbers uh, fall dramatically. Note that um, I have separated out 49 coins here. Um, these are from Alexandria, and this is the Feta Lane hoard, uh, which is now in the British Museum. And this is an unusual component amongst the single finds, which are otherwise represented here. I have not represented the coins by period. At the moment, I don't feel that there is enough data to show any particular concentration in one period or another. The coins I have seen cover all periods of minting from the 5th century BC to the 3rd century AD. The only areas where it might be said that there are concentrations are the 3rd century AD and the 3rd to 1st centuries BC. These periods, however, are particularly represented by the Feta Lane Hoard in the first case and coins of the Racket Collection in the second. 
This undoubtedly skews the numbers, and so I am reluctant at the moment to say that the data I have represents a fair assessment of the dates. So, what then are the possible explanations for the arrival of Greek and Roman provincial coins in Britain, either as contemporary losses or as later imports? It is clear that there is considerable evidence for at least some of these uh, coins arriving in the 1800s or later. These cases have been seized upon eagerly by those who wish to dismiss Greek and Roman provincial coin finds as fraudulent. A prime example of this is the case of the wreck of the HMS Pomona on the Needles in 1811. And here she is. HMS Pomona was a 38-gun, fifth-rate, leader-class frigate built in 1805. After operating in the Channel for much of 1806 and 1807, Pomona was posted to the Mediterranean in 1808. Following a number of successful actions against the French, Pomona was returning to Portsmouth in 1811, bearing, amongst other things, Sir Harford Jones, retiring ambassador to Persia, and several Arab stallions, gift of the Shah of Persia to King George III, when she hit Goose Rock at the western end of the Needles on the Isle of Wight. Uh, so there she is under full sail, and there is the wreck of the Pomona and uh, the Needles. Left without a rudder and severely holed, it was fortunate that Pomona did not sink immediately. Rescue and salvage crews from Yarmouth reached her within an hour and took off all 183 officers, crew and passengers. Remarkably, over the course of the next three days, Pomona's cargo, masts, cannon and other valuables were salvaged and even the horses were led to safety through the gun ports. After breaking up, Pomona was lost to the waves until a wreck site was discovered in 1974. This is thought to be the double wreck site of HMS Pomona and also an earlier shipwreck, the HMS Assurance, which was, was returning from Jamaica in 1753 when wrecked under similar circumstances. Again, the ship stuck on the rocks long enough for the crew and passengers to escape. It is thought, however, that this site contains the stern part of the Pomona and that the majority of the finds there belong to her. Edward Besley from the National Museum in Cardiff examined many of the coins uh, from this wreck in the 1980s and has very kindly given me photographs of some of the Alexandrian tetradrams found there, along with his listings. The Pomona is an excellent case study for the movement of ancient coins to Britain. There were, a number of, there were a large number of coins found at this wreck site, amongst which were these tetradrams, a sample of the 29 found there. In total, there were 57 coins, including 29 Alexandrian tetradrams and one coin of Malassa in Caria from the 2nd century BC. Oddly, I still don't know why. All the Alexandrian tetradrams are later 3rd century. Examples of Aurelian, Probus, Carinus, and Diocletian. <coughs> Eight of the coins were too corroded to be identified, but from shape and fabric are likely to be post-270. The other coins were one late 10th century Byzantine coin of John I, 11 17th to early 19th century coins of Naples and other Mediterranean cities, and 15 Spanish-American pieces of eight minted after the sinking of the Assurance, so therefore likely belonging to the Pomona. Pomona's last calls in the Mediterranean included Istanbul, where she collected the retiring ambassador, and other Mediterranean ports, and the coins found suggest this voyage nicely. It is highly likely that travellers, sailors or soldiers brought back souvenirs like this from the Mediterranean during this period, and, is, and it is probable that these provide at least some of the ancient coins found in Britain. This is the seafront at Bexhill-on-Sea on an August day. Bexhill is in East Sussex on the south coast of England, and this is a prime English seaside resort. Um, the, uh, it's, it's lovely, honestly. Um, the 4th century Athenian tetradram here was supposedly found in a cave in the 1950s, but unfortunately we have no further detailed information. While Ordinarily, one might suppose that precious metals would be more likely to travel far from their mints and bronze remain local. In Britain, it is actually more unusual to find silver Greek coins than it is to find bronze. 
Similarly, amongst the racket collection in, uh, in Dorset, coins without prov um, and in the section of coins without provenance, is this lifetime Alexander tetradram. Again, it is hard to know whether this formed part of Rackett's collection from local sources, or whether he acquired it in the course of his travels or acquaintances in scholarly circles, and he certainly spent um, far more time in London than he did in Dorset, according to the bishop. In his publications with Goodchild in 1937, Milne came up with a new theory for the arrival of these coins in Britain. His attention, attracted no doubt by the numbers of fairly large, though worn, coins, led him to suggest that the, these coins had been imported for their metal content. Thus, the worn condition which Ackerman felt spoke against them would in fact be a clue to their arrival here. It is an intriguing theory, but apart from the size of some of these coins, there is no real evidence to back this up. Milne does point to other known instances of copper alloy coins being used as scrap metal in more recent times, but there is no evidence of such bulk import or export of worn coins to be used in this way during Roman times or earlier. The continued discovery of coins like this Ptolemaic coin, now in the Wiltshire Museum in Devizes, may help, help to gather evidence for this, or it may point to the widespread collection of these coins as souvenirs by soldiers returning from Egypt after the various campaigns of recent times. <coughs> Amongst the vast numbers of insecurely provenance coins I have already described, there are a handful which may, said to, may be said to have come from properly excavated contexts. At the excavations in Dragonby in North Lincolnshire, for example, a coin of Brindisium was found in proper archaeological context amongst Roman period finds, while a coin of Narbo, modern Narbonne, was also supposedly found there as a surface find. Meanwhile, evidence from deposits such as Coventina's Well on Hadrian's Wall and the Roman Baths at Bath are also interesting in this context. I apologise for the dreadful... Um, picture which I scanned from the publication, although frankly I'm not sure that photographs of the coins would have been much better. Uh, these are coins uh, from Coventina's Well, and at Coventina's Well amongst the thousands of Roman coins and other artefacts are a handful of coins listed as unusual and non-Roman. These include the copper alloy co copy of the gold data of Philip II of Macedon, which you can see at the top. Uh, yep, here we go and Roman provincial coins such as this coin of Trajan from Cyprus, um, and also a coin of Gallienus from Asia Minor, and a coin of the First Jewish Revolt. In addition, this group contains small denomination coins of Charles II, George II, and Victoria, amongst others presumably representing the continued use of the site, or as later interpolations to the material on site during the excavations. How one represents the Greek and Roman provincial material is a difficult question. There was considerable confusion and controversy over the discovery and excavation of Co Coventina's well, and it is clear that the huge numbers of coins were, that huge numbers of coins were looted from the site before they were even recorded. Judging from those which remain, the tiny number of Greek or Roman provincial coins seems likely to have arrived during the Roman period when the site was in everyday use. It seems highly unlikely that they would have been deposited on the site during the 1800s as it was being investigated. One theory is that they were deposited during Roman times as offerings at the shrine, since they were worn and of little use in the local economy. An ancient parallel perhaps to modern wishing wells or collection tubs, which always accumulate a certain number of foreign coins, no longer of any use to their owners. Though, as Alison Jones and McKay point out in their publication of the finds from Coventine as well, the coins may also represent a treasured possession brought from afar, and so a fitting offering at the shrine. David Walker's 1988 publication of the 12,595 coins found during the excavations at the Sacred Spring at Bath included a group of 20 coins of Trajan minted at Antioch in AD 116. All are very worn, and one even bears a Syrian countermark, which strongly suggests that they had been in circulation in the East before arriving in Britain. And that's the, uh, the excavations in, in progress. 
and here are the coins. Walker's contention throughout his publication is that the Roman authorities deliberately shipped certain series of bronze coins to Britain for circulation. In this context, the 20 coins of Antioch could be seen as a group gathered from circulation and shipped, amongst others, to Britain. While Walker suggests that these coins might have been brought to Britain to fill the denomination gap below the ass, Curtis Clay's review of the volume in the Numismatic Chronicle of 1989 points out that the majority of the coins were in fact the larger of the two denominations struck at Antioch at this time and therefore would equate to the ass rather than act as a semis, <coughs> as, as Walker suggested. Additionally, while Walker suggests that these coins must have been shipped shortly after minting in Syria and thus connected to Hadrian's return from Antioch to Rome in 117-8 and his visit to Britain in 122, Clay points to the condition of the coins recovered from Bath to suggest a later date. Clay also highlights examples in better condition than these, and you can see they're, they're rather dreadful, um, in the Garonne hoard of um, about 160, and so suggests that the coins which reached Britain must have probably done so after AD 160 at least. Even where Greek coins have been found in archaeological context, their interpretation has also, I'm sad to say, also been controversial. This coin of Ptolemy V was discovered in Winchester, in Hampshire, in the excavations of the Westgate car park in 1950-51. It was found in a layer which contained a mixture of late Bronze Age and early Iron Age material, and also a few artefacts of early Roman date. This layer was also below the early Roman town defences. Supposedly also a coin of Commodus from Alexandria came from the same trench, but was only picked up on the dump after excavations. Collis wrote an influential note about this find in 1975, concluding that the, the occurrence of two Egyptian coins from the same trench on the same site, both in an exceptional state of preservation for that site, suggests that this is another joke which has backfired on the archaeological world. A couple of months later, Biddle wrote in support of this coin in the context of other Ptolemaic coins found in Winchester, and he lists 10 found there between 1845 and 1955. None of them has the same kind of provenance as that of Ptolemy V here, but Biddle points out that there would be no reason to doubt these finds other than the fact that they are Ptolemaic coins. Biddle's conclusion is that any explanation of these finds in terms of modern loss will have to account for the circumstances of all of these discoveries. Meanwhile, although some of the finds may be suspicious, the evidence of the group as a whole suggests that it should be regarded as innocent until proven guilty. This balanced opinion is probably the right starting point, whatever the eventual conclusions may be. It is very easy to dismiss these coins one by one as they come up, as they often do, but looking at a large group of similar material suggests that there may be something else going on. The explanation that a wide variety of tricksters has been plaguing the countryside for the last 200 years, planting these coins, seems to me a much wilder proposition than the idea that at least some of these coins might have arrived here during the Roman period, if not before. Though most of the Greek and Roman provincial coins found in Britain are single finds, there are a few which have appeared in hordes. This table represents the coins found in hoards across Britain, recorded by Robertson in the Romano-British Coin Hoards volume. In comparison to the majority of single finds, you can observe that silver drams occur in nine of the 23 hoards listed. So, uh, yes, see here in particular, there's quite a lot of them. Robertson gathered her material from numerous historic publications, and this means that it is not always possible to find the coins she describes. However, the dram of, of Trajan from Caesarea is now in the British Museum. Uh, and it's in the Muswell Hill Hoard, if I can... Ah, here we go. Yes, this one. And here we go. The Muswell Hill Hoard was, de was declared treasure trove in 1928, and Her Majesty's Treasury donated it to the British Museum. This one coin of Trajan, 
was amongst a horde of 653 denarii, mostly from Rome, ranging from Mark Antony to Gita. The hoard did include two Septimius Severus uh, coins uh, from Antioch as well. These coins were part of the imperial system and it is likely that drams from Caesarea as well as Lycia were an acceptable part of this from the evidence we see from the hoards. They form a tiny fraction of the Roman silver discovered in Britain but their presence indicates that silver coins at least may have been acceptable amongst the more standard issues in the circulating currency. Turning back to the table again, you will also notice that Alexandrian tetragrams occur both in hordes and both as hordes entirely and as single coins within hordes. So these two in particular are all, oh, I think I'm running out of battery, uh, are all Alexandrian tetragrams, but here we have one or perhaps two coins um, amongst others. Michel Amandri has considered the coins of Roman Alexandria alone um, as finds across Europe and he's gathered information on hordes and some single finds um, from right across Europe including Britain. His work published in 2005 throws up another question. Should we consider different types of coins differently? So far most analyses, mine included, have considered this material as one large group as, as as one large group of foreign material. Their range, however, does encompass about 500 years of minting, so there is plenty of scope to look at large subgroups within this to see whether any pattern emerges. Amondri points out that the vast majority of the coins from Roman Alexandria, which arrive in Europe, are of the 3rd century AD, and many from the years immediately before Diocletian's reform and the end of the series in 297. This is certainly true of much of the material here, particularly that found in the two hordes containing only tetradrams, um, Cherbourg, which is this one, and the Fetalane hoard in London, although Fetalane does actually contain some earlier material as well. There are a number of explanations which have been considered in the European context. Whether troop movements in the third century might have led to Egyptian coins moving northwards, or whether the currency crisis of the 3rd century might have led to other non-official coins being used as Roman imperial issues, or simply that these coins were moving as a metal source. The problem, as Amandri points out, is that, that there, is that there is little or no corroborating contemporary evidence for this. This is not a topic considered in Britain alone, as Amandri's work points out. There have been a number of considerations of Mediterranean material in parts of Europe where these coins would have had no official part of the, current of the coinage system. Leaving aside the well-documented movement of precious metal coinages, particularly from Macedon and Thrace into Central Europe, material similar to coins found in Britain has been dis discovered right across Europe, especially in France and Belgium, where the groupings of coins from the Eastern Mediterranean look very similar to those found in Britain. And the worn state of many of these coins, again, bears similar features with the British finds. Amundry's conclusion that there may be more than one answer and that most of our information is built on unreliable sources is also an important matter to remember. One of the reasons to look at this matter again now is because there is an increasing number of coins being recorded on the Portable Antiquity Scheme database. You can see here the finds of Greek and Roman provincial coins in Britain recorded up to 2012. These are all single finds and as you can see they are spread out right across the country. There are 168 coins represented here, although from the database it does look like a few might have been misattributed, particularly those in Wales uh, due to some errors in the bulk import of uh, a volume on coin finds in Wales. So. Uh, this area might not be as well populated um, as, it, as it looks. Although from the um, National Museum in Cardiff, um, there are definitely some Greek and Roman provincial coins from, from this area, um, which have been found over the last hundred years. So apart from the, the possible errors in Wales, um, this map really brings the focus away from the south of England and further northwards. 
Apart from Dragonby in North Lincolnshire and Coventine as well, I have only presented examples to you this evening which have come from the south. The coins represented here on this map are all from the groups or I have already described, including finds of Lycian drams from Suffolk and Berkshire, and large numbers of Alexandrian tetradrams from all over the country, from the Isle of Wight in the south up to West Yorkshire in the north. The numbers of Punic or Numidian coins are also increasing, and um, even though their identification has sometimes been confused. Despite much work done by the PAS and especially Sam Moorhead and David Holman, they are still often confused with Iron Age British coins and are described as such on sites such as eBay, where they're, they're being sold in some numbers. Um, and these are often, unfortunately, going unrecorded, which is a huge shame because they could help to highlight which regions have higher numbers of these coins. The dates for, for the coins here are also, again, similar to what I found in the museums, right from the 5th century BC down to the 3rd century AD. But unlike the data I've already presented to you, two-thirds of the finds here are Roman provincial. So um, the finds I presented before, 234 were Greek and 213 Roman provincial. And of the Roman provincial coins here, about half of them are third century. Um, so it might be that this is a distinct phenomenon to investigate further. And again, it's the Alexandrian tetradrams which are furnishing the, uh, the, a large number of, of these. Another very obvious thing to note from this map is that there may be finds held in museums much further north than my initial area of survey, though whether they will have secure provenances is another matter. The trends one can pull out of this mess of information are, at the moment, very few. Though there are examples from across the Mediterranean and from all periods, from classical to Roman, the more common coins appear to be from southern Italy and Sicily, North Africa, both the Maghreb and Egypt, and from the Levant. Though not as corroded as many examples of Roman coins found in Britain, they are almost all very worn and almost all of copper alloys rather than gold or silver. Apart from the four cases where large numbers have been found, Exeter, Dorset, Cherbourg and Fetter Lane, they are almost all single finds or in very small numbers. The work of the Portable Antiquities Scheme in this is increasingly showing how widespread a phenomenon this is, and not simply restricted to the south of England. This is in line with the increasing numbers of Roman coins found right across the country, which are revolutionising our ideas of coin use in Roman Britain. Once more information has been gathered from both the PAS and from museum collections and archives, it may be possible to determine whether there are regional differences in the types or periods of Greek and Roman provincial coins found in Britain. And one example of this is David Holman's work on Punic coins found in Kent. Um, and this is especially interesting, and I hope in future it may be possible to see whether there are similarities with this area, with the nearest part of the European mainland, where North African finds have also been reported. Collecting examples of these coins from various museums is an ongoing process. The situation at Exeter and Dorchester is very unusual. It is much more typical to find one or perhaps two Greek or Roman provincial coins with a British provenance per museum or collection. The data gathered so far is heavily skewed by those two major collections, and the inherent problems in the material have long cast a shadow over any serious attempt to gather more information. There is much still to do, therefore, to, col to collect the evidence for this survey, especially looking further northwards for new examples. I think it is clear that the explanation of the discovery of Greek and Roman provincial coins may be very complex indeed. It is certainly clear that it is far too simplistic to say that all such coins are the result of modern loss, or indeed that all such Greek coins are evidence of a thriving use of these coins in trade in pre-Roman Britain. In combination with other studies across the Channel, it is important to look at the evidence again to discover which coins might be said to have a secure ancient provenance and what this can tell us. Though cases such as the Pomona and other infamous instances of sites being salted in modern times, um, unfortunately for the benefit of visiting American metal detectorists, um, are well documented. But this should not automatically mean that all finds of ancient coins far from their origins should be dismissed. 
since many of these finds have previously been examined in isolation, my aim is to gather as much material as possible to examine these questions and to see whether these coins can be classified in any logical way. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, I've, I've put up a very long list of thanks because this would not have been possible without uh, the help of colleagues in many different uh, museums and collections across Britain.